This is Penn Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends. This is uh, October the 19th, I believe, 18th or 19th of 1972. And uh, uh, we're in Oklahoma City, and we are interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends, Yvonne Choteau, one of the great ballerinas of the world. Uh, the, uh, uh, we will, to, to start off, I will, the, although the name is well known, I will spell it because we always do that, and I hope I spell it correct. Uh, it's uh, y v o n n e c h o u t e a u. And would you give me the spelling of your your married name? Yes, Pen. It's uh, pronounced Terakoff, and it's T E R E K H O V. That, of course, is another famous name in uh, the uh, world of ballet. Uh, the world of ballet, because uh, Miss Chateau's husband is uh, one of the great ballet. Uh, dances the world too. Uh, this uh, interview, I will will start off. I'd like for you to give me a little bit of your family background and your personal background. Well, it's uh, quite extensive and yet quite limited. I am an only child, born of the union of Corbett Edward Choteau and my mother Lucy Annette. My father is a native Oklahoman, of course, and my mother is from the Deep South, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I was born in Venita in the old family home, March the 7th, 1929. So now you know how old I am. <laughs> There's no use hiding it, and it's something actually I'm very proud <laughs> of my 43 years. It has, uh, it's been hard work in this life in the ballet, as Miss Tallchief would also tell you. But it has been deeply gratifying, and I have been blessed in the sense that both of my parents were very great help to me. It wasn't something that I alone wanted, you know, but the three of us were more or less uh, working towards it as I grew up. Of course, I started very, very young. I would say perhaps too young, but then, you know, dancing is natural. Children dance so naturally, and there are so many things written in the Bible, as you know, about dancing. Dancing, you know, for the glory of God, just the sheer joy of children dancing. So I was able to satisfy uh, along these lines a certain vocation as I've always been deeply attached to my church. One time I had thought even of serving in the church. So what is your church? I'm Roman Catholic, yeah. as my husband is. And I had thought before I met him, you know, that my life would just be devoted to dancing. Then I would perhaps join a convent or some way in which I could serve God. But as you see, my life has worked out very differently. God had other plans. <laughs> I found a wonderful husband and have two very beautiful young daughters. Uh, you're descended from, a, of course, the Chateau name is, uh, is a famous early name in our Oklahoma history. And uh, uh, would you uh, give a little of your descendancy there? I, I'm not as concerned about uh, exact documentation because this, of course, is a matter of record. But uh, uh, tell a little about uh, your descendants. Uh, well, Penn, now, I'm not really an expert on that, my father. Uh, knows every detail of the history. I do know that I am the great, great, great granddaughter of Jean-Pierre Chouteau, and of course they were the, the French fur traders, came to Salina, and it seems that they were very much beloved in the stories that I have read by the Osage Indian, you know, and they had made very good and close contact with that particular tribe. And then uh, somewhere along the line there, I, I don't know if it was Auguste or Francois, but one of them married a Shawnee Indian princess, Mary Silverheels. So I presume that that is where my Shawnee Indian blood comes in. How much Shawnee blood do you have, do you know? With my father's uh, heritage, and then my mother has some also. It comes to about one quarter. Mm -hmm. well, I'm Shawnee on the Cherokee roll. Maybe that name Silverheels has something to do with ballet. <laughs> a lot of people suggested that I should take that name for the stage when I became a professional, but I said, it is lovely, but I prefer to keep my own name. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you were born in what town? Venita, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Venita and about growing up uh, in Venita? Well, I mo we moved here to Oklahoma City. All I remember of Venita is the old white homestead with Grandmother Chouteau, and I remember, even as a baby, sitting on her knee while she churned the buttermilk. And I remember we went back every Christmas to visit her always until the, the home burned down. But we moved here when I was not even two years old. And that's 
where I remember this is what you know I really can call home Oklahoma City because the, some of the happiest years of my life were spent here growing up I stayed here until I was 12 you see I went to all the schools here in Oklahoma City and then I left to go to New York not knowing that I wouldn't return I was just going to go to study but I got there and I entered a competitive competition and I won a scholarship and I didn't come home for many years the uh, where did you go to school in Oklahoma Oh, I went to Wilson and Edgemere. I remember Edgemere with much happiness. And I, I went to Villa Teresa, and I went to Rosary School. Just all of them were great, great moments in my life. And I always referred to home whenever, wherever I would be touring around the world. Now, you started your study of uh, ballet at the age of three. Here, in, oh, here in Oklahoma City. Who did you study under? Frony Asher. Uh, can you tell us something about Frony Asher? Frony uh, was very beloved by all Oklahomans. She was uh, one of the few really uh, knowledgeable teachers, I would say, of ballet at that time. It's often been brought up, and it's so strange, but uh, in the course of my career, and you know, I had a, a very active career, I would dance at least 10 to 12 times a week for 14 years without stopping. People would come to me and they would say, how is it that Oklahoma has produced five Indian ballerinas who have, you know, accomplished for themselves quite a bit in this particular area? And, you know, we all of us, the five of us, thought quite a bit about it, and we assumed that perhaps that Indian heritage, which comes so natural to the Indian, the fleet of footness, you know, and the lightness and the, the grace, the agility, you know, must have contributed a great deal to it. Because, of course, there is Maria and Marjorie Talchi. Then there's Rosella Hightower from Ardmore. Mosselin Larkin from Tulsa. And, of course, myself. The, uh, were, you, uh, were you contemporary in study with any of those as, uh, in, as an amateur before you became professor? I had known, of course, of the Tall Chiefs here in Oklahoma. But they had moved away to California several years earlier, and I went out to California to study in 39, and I met the tall chief girls who were studying there also. They were a little younger than you, weren't they? No, they're older they're, than they're I older? am. I'm the youngest of all the Indian ballerinas. Yeah. Well. And uh, Miss Hightower I had met when I went to Kansas City. She had since moved to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. But then, after the, I would say after the period of 1943, when I joined Ballet Russe, and Miss Tall Chief was with Ballet Russe already, we all were climbing up in our careers, you know, respectively at the same time. The, um, in, uh, in your studies in high school, in, as you went through school here, why don't you, what was your first public appearance in Oklahoma, just as a child, I'm sure? Well, now this is <laughs> coming to a very uh, sentimental moment because my very first public appearance was at the Hall of Fame banquet on Statehood Day for Mrs. Anna B. Corn. And that's what I will be commemorating You're this November the 16th. It mm -hmm. be 40 years of appearing before the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you, gave a, you gave a dance at I the Hall of Fame? I gave a dance, and I was the flower girl. And, of course, uh, I was quite active at that time. And, oh, representing Oklahoma mm -hmm. throughout the United States as a goodwill ambassadress. And I would go. I, the governors, Governor Marlin would appoint me in some official task, you know, to mm -hmm. go to... Chicago, Illinois, and represent Oklahoma in the World's Fair there. Not, and just many, many things like that, too numerous to even, even mention, you know. So I st remained very active until 12 years of age when I left here. Uh, you, uh, uh, obviously, and I, I realize that uh, you, you uh, uh, would feel maybe a little modest about this, but obviously you, you showed up as an outstanding ballerina at an early age because you were selected to do some of these things. Um, the uh, uh, were there many people studying ballet during this early period in Oklahoma City? Yes, I have run across since I've been home many of my old friends who were studying ballet. Of course, uh, the majority of my friends did not wish to pursue so dedicated a life. You know, they uh, preferred you know to raise a family and uh, just uh, a more normal life. It was I was warned, forewarned, well ahead of time that it would be a life of great sacrifice and uh, a giving up of normal pleasures. You know, and I couldn't belong to brownies or whatever. You know, little clubs like that. I knew it would be much, much hard work, and yet my parents were really great because you know they maintained a normal life atmosphere for me. I had my little friends, and I went 
the birthday parties, and, you know, I don't feel that until I got there to New York City that uh, my life became so, you would say, abnormal with hard work. To what extent did you practice uh, ballet as a child during the, how many hours a day? Did you I, I would take a lesson every day. And then, of course, after I went to New York, I went to professional children's school, which means that I would go to school two or three hours a day. Then I would be released to go and work at least six hours of classes a day. Then I would have to go home. My mother accompanied me, chaperoned me, and I would have to stay up very late with my uh, homework, academic, scholastic studies. So it was, a, it's, it was a very demanding and dedicated life, but I was surrounded by a group of other children who were all training to be actors or actresses or in the professional world of the theater. At some point very early, you at least considered, I'm sure, the possibility of a profession in, in the field of dance. Uh, uh, at what point was that? I would have to say it was after I arrived in New York and saw the thousands and thousands of youngsters that I would be competing with. It kind of overwhelmed me because here, of course, you know, you could, there were not that many who wanted to make it their lifestyle. And that really impressed me. And I saw I was going to really have to work if I was going to succeed at all. Mm. And how seriously they took it. They took it, you know, it was just the most serious thing in their life because, well, that's what art's all about, you know, mm -hmm. it's a means of communicating to mm -hmm. people. Uh, what, uh what school did, uh, was this that you went to there? It's called Professional Children's School, and it's geared towards youngsters who are considering a life in the theater, professional life. Uh, sure. Uh, what age were you at that time? Well, I was 12 when I went to New York, yes. Oh, that was 1941. Oh. And I, you see, I entered this uh, competition for scholarships, mm -hmm. and quite to my amazement, I won. Mm -hmm. So that began two very intense years of study, as I described to you. Mm -hmm. And then at 14, 1943, mm -hmm. I was accepted into the professional company of Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. I was the youngest American ever to be accepted into a professional company. I guess I saw you the first time at, uh, it was either Newport News or, uh, or uh, Norfolk when the Ballet Russe performed, and I was in the Army. Uh, Norfolk, Virginia? Yes, I Norfolk. remember it very well, 1945. yes. 1945. That was my second year with the company. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I was about 16. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I, I saw the Ballet Russe. Uh, I was in the Army stationed at Newport News and saw the Ballet Russe at Norfolk. It's a small world. Yes, when you start is. traveling, you meet so many beloved and fellow friends from That's Oklahoma. Right. They're spread That's out all over. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the, uh, in the, now when you got in, how many were in the school at New York? Oh, well, there were thousands. You know, the, the uh, competition the was open. Mm -hmm. I had to you know, to compete with hundreds of others. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, how many scholarships? Uh, how many scholarships? They awarded there? three. Three scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Three age categories. Mm -hmm. Did the other two go into the profession? Uh, one was a little girl from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And she, yes, she later joined Ballet Russe also. Mm -hmm. And then there was uh, a little French girl, Tanaki Leclerc, who won one. And then in the older group division. Yes, they all had mm -hmm. professional lives. Uh, the Ballet Russe, uh, uh, it, it, came, it was headquartered originally. It came out of Moscow, didn't it? Wasn't it organized Monte out there? Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo. Yes. Monte Carlo. And they well, broke away from the original, see, Russian Ballet. The original yes. was the Russian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the headquarters were in Monte Carlo. Then they came to this country, in Amer in, uh, to America, in 1933. And, of course, oh. that's when Ballet you know, started touring around the United States and becoming very popular. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us something about Ballet Russe, its organization, and uh, its people. Well, of course, it is now defunct, but it was the reigning company. It was one of the reigning companies in the period, you know, from 1940 on through until the early 60s. Miss Tall Chief and myself and Miss Larkin, it was our home company, see. Mm -hmm. It has produced some great artists. Of course, some of the greatest ballerinas in the world have been in it. I have to mention my own mentor, Madame Danilova, who was so instrumental in both the lives of Maria and myself, and Madame Chauvide and, and Madame Alonso, all of the very greatest artists living. And I'm, you know, very deeply grateful for the time and the work that they spent with me, helping me to mature as an artist. 
When you uh, did you pra how much practice and how did you practice when you were with the ballet russe? Well, it's schedule? no one would believe it's total involvement. It just doesn't end or stop. It's just constant. See, it just goes on and on. Usually, if we were in New York, let's say beginning a season in August, we would start rehearsing. We'd have a class first from 9:30 to 10:30 or 11. Then you'd have a 15-minute break. Then you'd go right away into your rehearsal a break for an hour for lunch, then all day rehearsing until 6, and then you'd get to go home and rest. However, now if you're performing, that's the same story, except you have to go to the theater by 6.30, get your makeup on, warm up again, believe it or not. You have to constantly keep those muscles in shape, just like, you know, a boxer or any athlete. And then the curtain would rise at 8.30, and the curtain would come down, union regulations, at 11.15 or 11.30, then you'd get to go home and <laughs> clean your toe shoes and wash your tights. But, you know, it was, it was everyone that you were involved with. It was life. That was life itself. You know, there was no other thought of any other kind of life but your dedication to your art. So it wasn't so hard under those circumstances. How many countries, uh, of course, uh, uh, or what are some of the countries that were represented in the ballet room? Oh. Well, at the time that I went in in 43, it was quite unusual for two American Indian girls to be there. And I was, uh, really, the year before, uh, there was mostly Russian and French. When, now, the year that I went in, quite a few young Americans were also put in, all from the same school, School of American Ballet. And French was the company language. You know, you were spoken to in French because, of course, ballet, you speak, mm -hmm. uh, involves the French language, just like Latin is used for botany or so on. So you picked up quite a smattering of Russian and French. Of course, I had studied French in school. That was one of the requirements. What were the uh, reasons for the demise of the ballet uh, Mostly financial. It is so incredibly expensive to operate a performing company, just as the Metropolitan Opera can no longer tour because of the terrible expense. And of course, you know, transporting that many people around, 125 dancers, 50 musicians, stagehands, crew, it's just, you know, the, but when I joined, we were fortunate because we had, the dancers had three train, three cars, Pullmans, you know. Then, of course, as we traveled more, plane travel began, but it's just, ex the, you know, it's just too expensive, really. And this country, you see, does not subsidize yet the arts the way the, your European countries do in South America. What has replaced uh, in, uh, wh what would you consider the number one ballet now? Well, there are several good companies left, not nearly enough to support all, just even these young dancers we're training here in Oklahoma. They are outstandingly talented. There are just not enough professional companies. That's why we've tried to get a good local group going, Civic. But there are uh, existing today the American Ballet Theater, which has as its home base now Kennedy Center in Washington, as well as schools in New York. There's the Harkness Ballet and, of course, the New York City Ballet, of which George Balanchine is the director. The Metropolitan Opera has a company, but it's more or less a uh, second banana to the opera. There's just it's not enough company. Joffrey, there's the Robert Joffrey Company. Of course, many new modern groups, Alvin Ailey and things like this. But we have so many good dancers here in America and just not enough home places for them to perform. Can you talk a little about the roles that you played in the Ballet Russe, uh, b uh, your first role when you first came in, and uh, some, of the other, uh, some of the other roles as time went on? Well, now, that's rather like asking a mother what her favorite, who her favorite child is. I would have to say without any doubt that my, my favorite heroine that I portrayed was Juliet in Romeo and Juliet, and I have performed it until recently, and if I had a chance, I'd do it again. Uh, I was... Lucky, as I said, Madame Danilova coached me very much in the company and looked after me, took me under her wing because I was the baby of the company. They gave me my first solo when I was 16, and it was called Prayer, La Prière in the ballet Coppelia. Of course, she used to tease me. She'd say, it was just because you had beautiful long blonde hair, Ivan, because they didn't want me to get a big head, you know. They keep you very humble in the world of the ballet. And then I did a, a lovely part called The Bluebird, The Princess in the Bluebird, and there was the uh, famous Blue Danube, Beau Danube, and a part called Snow Maiden. 
all every part that I did, it became a part of me, and I loved it. And then, of course, Giselle, gradually. Giselle is sort of to the ballerina what Hamlet is to the actor. It involves tremendous acting. And then aside from your acting in the first act, then you must, you know, you become a lyrical creature in the second act. And really, well, Ballet Russe gave me all of my the parts that I love, but I would have to say that since I've been home, my husband, who's a really a very great choreographer, Miguel, has staged some, some of the things that have been most deeply satisfying for me also. He staged a full-length Romeo and Juliet for, for me, Undine, the, so the story of the little sea nymph, and just many delightful parts. It's been a, a joy and a pleasure to dance for people here in Oklahoma because they are very knowledgeable about ballet. And our audiences there at the University of Oklahoma, they, uh, most of them, a lot of them have been all over the world. They've seen all of the great companies, and they compare the company that Miguel and I have worked so hard to form over there and here. They have compared it favorably, you know, with international and national professional companies, which makes us happy. Why don't you talk about Miguel? Where did y'all meet? We met in Ballet Russe. Where else? <laughs> uh, uh, t tell a little about uh, about your your relationship when you were married and uh, the uh, uh, the the part that uh, you all played together, uh, the roles that you played together. Well, of course, they cast us together quite a bit. But when he first approached me and asked me to go out and have some pizza with him, I said, "Oh no!" I said, "I'm not interested in, in uh, dating." I said, I, "My life is my ballet," and I thought, "You're much too good looking anyway. All the other ballerinas like you." So I didn't see him for one year, <laughs> and then he approached me again about a year later. And by that time, I had decided, I had observed him all this time, that he was very intelligent and very gentle and very kind, in spite of his great good looks. And so I, I went out to dinner with him. We had uh, my best girlfriend in the company was Gertrude Tyvon from Helsinki, Finland. And she was going with my husband's best friend, Eugene Slavin, who was from Argentina, Buenos Aires. So we had a double date, and I just it, it just grew into a beautiful and a wonderful friendship, touring together, dancing together. And then finally he says, well, you know, I think that we should make this a union. So we were married there in New York City, and we kept on touring with the company. And about a year later, our first daughter was born, who's Christina Marie. She's now 15. Then we went to, a, I took a maternity leave from the company, and Miguel traveled and did a little bit more touring in South America with Ballet Russe. And finally we decided that uh, being parents was such a valuable and beautiful thing that it wouldn't be, we didn't want to leave our daughter with grandmother and keep on touring because I wanted to be a mother in the true sense of the word. So we left the company and went to live in my husband's hometown, which is Montevideo, Uruguay. So we went down there to visit. We were scheduled to dance at the Sodre Theater there, which is the National Opera and Ballet Company. Well, lo and behold, we signed our contracts, and Yvonne didn't feel very well because of the change of climate. But it wasn't the change of climate. It was the arrival of Elizabeth, our second daughter. Um. <laughs> so she was born down there, and we stayed another six months, and then we decided to come back to this country, which we did, and we arrived in Oklahoma in 1961 just for a visit, wanted my mother and father to see the children. And what, during our visit here, President George Cross from the University of Oklahoma extended an invitation to teach for a while there at the university. Well, we, we decided we would. We had no idea if it would be successful or not, you know, because how would ballet go on a big football campus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but it was extremely successful from the beginning, and so we have remained on throughout all these years. I've always heard that the movements of uh, of dance would be good are good is good training for athletics. Excellent coordination. In fact, the football players were taking ballet from uh, another local school here in the city just for this coordination of the move. Ballet is good for many things. You see, all the athletes in Europe, Russia, Yugoslavia, they all have some sort of ballet training. Some of our greatest European male dancers have been athletes before they studied the ballet. Where did ballet originate? It started out in France and Italy and proceeded on into the courts and then into Russia and then finally to England and to America. The first ballet was, I think, done for Catherine de' Medici. Mm -hmm. Did you ever do any Indian dancing? Yes, I did. <laughs> My
my father used to take me to the Indian reservations, and he wanted me to learn these little dances, which are their very intricate, complicated steps. But, oh, I used to love going to the reservations and see those the little Indian boys doing their little war dances, and those feet would move so quickly. Yes, I did quite a bit of that representing Oklahoma. Tell about the, the reservations you went. Which, which reservations? Oh, he took me to every place in this state. I, there's not one town in Oklahoma that I have not been to. I just, have we covered the whole state. Can you, uh, uh, can you tell a little about the life on the reservations as you saw them? Oh, well. I realize you were making quick trips. And yes, time. yes. I was uh, struck by the, the beauty and the simplicity of the Indians' life, and they were so poetic. You know, it seems that they had produced so many fine musicians, so many poets, you know. This struck me. And, the, you know, the utter simplicity, because in art, that's what you sort of are searching for in the end, an ultimate simplicity. You know, not a mass of seeming contradictions. But it seemed so unfettered, and the air was so pure, and I especially thought back many times to this after I left here. You know, how the pollution and the complications of large city living. And I thought, well, I would really like very much to return to Oklahoma. I always had this in the back of my mind. It's just everything is so open here. People are so friendly and so great. You just don't have this concern, you know, other places. And I've heard many people say that. It's not just me. Tell about your experience at OU. We uh, left that, but you, we, after we, uh, we, in our conversation, but tell about the experiences you've had at OU since you started teaching. Well, they have, uh, have, in a way, you know, as my mother has said many times to me, says, your life really has not stopped. If you thought by coming home you were going to get a rest, <laughs> she says, you've gotten busier than ever. And to this day, she'll say, Yvonne, please start taking it easy. Instead, it seems to be a whirlwind. It gets busier and busier because the demand for teaching is getting greater. We have accommodate students from, you know, many, many states there at OU. And it's been a joy to know all these students, from some from New York, some from Texas, you know, just all over, people from out of the country even. And each year we have managed to put on, for the benefit of the students, a, you know, a performance, a professional performance, which it's, all, it's called an evening of ballet, I'm sure you have attended. And this is very good professional experience for the students. They're able to perform on a stage. Here in Oklahoma City, we've had the Civic Ballet, and we've invited our first guest artist, we invited Maria down to do the Nutcracker. 6,000 people attended that performance. That's before they uh, redid the Muni. We've had all of the great names in the world of ballet as guest artists with the Oklahoma City Civic Ballet. Uh, you're involved also a little with OCU, aren't you? Oklahoma City University? Uh, well, you? no, you not just, at all. Oh, just, just university? Yes. Mm -hmm. the, uh, what are you teaching down there now? How many classes are you teaching? It's not enough, I'll tell yeah. you that. I teach the advanced class three times a week. That's an hour and a half. And then my husband has the intermediate class three times a week. And these are classes of 30, mm -hmm. at least, not 35. Then in your more basic beginning classes, we have been fortunate in hiring an instructor, Miss Victoria Lee, who is a former professional dancer with American Ballet Theater. And goodness, I mean, there we have, I think we have 200 ballet majors at the moment. My goodness. And I have here in my school, I have a school here, you know, Academy mm -hmm. of Ballet, and I mm -hmm. take from 5 to 16, mm -hmm. ages 5 years of age to 16. I have 216 pupils. So ballet's caught on. <laughs> Have you, uh, uh, have any of your pupils become professional? I have three girls right now in New York City studying that I produced. I started with them when they were seven or eight, worked with them through 16, and they have all been given scholarships in very good schools there, so they're well on their way. Who are they? Well, one is Susan Hankinson, one is Sandra Battles, one was Barbara Ray. Mm -hmm. are the, where are they from? Well, they're from Oklahoma. They're from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, mm -hmm. Right. Any Indians? I had one little Indian, but she decided to get married and have a family. Oh, <laughs> she was yeah. very, very promising. And many of our students from OU graduated and went on into Broadway or musical comedy. Uh, one girl is, is in, right now at Radio City. It's very hard, the openings into a ballet company mm -hmm. at this particular time. Yes, it would be during... So limited. See, all of the older ones are staying on because of the lack of companies to dance in, so there's not much place for new young talent. 
Is Maria Tallchief, uh, you mentioned her, is she teaching now at uh, Chicago? Uh, not on a, uh, just a regular basis, but she does do a tremendous amount of lecture demonstrations, and she helps in you know, whatever way she can, ballet-wise. Mm -hmm. Is she performing regularly now? Well, she has retired. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I thought that she had. She retired several years ago. She felt that the strain was just too great, you know, to to try and uh, keep your be with your family and be with them and keep performing also because, of course, she is such a perfectionist mm -hmm. that she would not settle for anything less than perfection. Mm -hmm. We were so happy to see her. She was here a few weeks ago yes. mm -hmm. to help us judge our dancers for the new Oklahoma City Ballet. And it was just, you know, like old, like it is with old friends. It was like you had never been separated. It's been many years since we've seen each other. A ballet like acrobatics is a uh, is a uh, athletic sort of thing in certain respects, as well as a uh, as well as a uh, uh, as an artistic uh, thing. What? Absolutely. And uh, what would you say that uh, I, you know, in in a field that requires both a uh, uh, combination of athletic and artistic ability, there are generally age limitations, just as there are in, uh, just as there is in uh, professional football, baseball, and such. What would you say is the ideal age, and what would you say would be generally the maximum uh, period of uh, performance for an individual? Well, you were very wise when you said art is athletic, and it's also a science. Mm -hmm. See, it combines both. Now, unfortunately, in the world of art, Ballet is the most limited of, of the performing arts because your training starts so early and finishes so early. By early, I mean that you cannot dance until your 60s or 70s, like perhaps a poet can write or an actress act. Dancing should start at seven or eight years of age, and it takes about approximately 10 years to become an accomplished dancer. Then by the time you get into a company and work your way up, that's another seven, eight years, you know. Then you have probably seven or eight peak years, and it's over. Now, the majority of dancers retire around 35. The, if, if you really, you know, work at it, of course, you can now keep on until... Well, let, let me show you an example. I'm sure you know of Dame Margot Fontaine. Mm -hmm. Well, she is almost 60, and yet you would look at her on stage, you would think she's 17. Mm -hmm. Another remarkable example is Alicia Alonso, the Cuban ballerina. She's the same, approaching 60, and you just, th th they're ageless. They have no age, like the famous Russian ballerina, Galina Ulanova. She danced until she was almost 60, but she was very careful. She was ill with consumption, and they allowed her to dance only once a month. But when the news spread, you know, throughout the Russia, it was like a national thing. The, all the people, not even, not just, you know, the people, the peasant, the working people, they would flock, there would be lines just to see her dance. She was so great. And, of course, um, you see, Miss Tallchief retired not because she had to or because of age. It's just that she just retired. She could still, I hear she's dancing beautifully still. Mm -hmm. The... Uh, uh, one thing that we're doing in our, in our uh, Living Legends effort, to, in addition to uh, making interviews, we're developing uh, some audio visuals, which uh, uh, in in the area of Oklahoma, particularly, that will that dramatize certain things about Oklahoma. And one of them is a little different from uh, from the other group. Uh, we're titling First Families, and uh, basically, it's uh, the the term First Families comes from the, the art will be people of Indian origin in various fields, um, Indian origin or who have a background partially Indian. Um, I wonder if uh, you might suggest some of the people in the field of arts or in other fields that you feel we should interview in this. Of Indian heritage? Yes, of Indian heritage. Well, of course. Oklahoma. We're talking about Oklahoma yes. Indian. The first person I would say, if he's no longer with us, is, was my dear friend A.C. Blue Eagle. Then, of course, mm -hmm. uh, this promising young man, Jerome Tiger, who did such beautiful work. He was, of course, you know, the artist for the Four Moons Ballet that we did here in Oklahoma. But he died at an early, a very tragic accident. There is, uh, living here now, a famous opera singer, Teata, which you probably know. I could give you her number gladly. And there, well, I would, I would have to think about it, Penn. I, there are many that I could recommend. What, uh, Dick West. Yes. Uh -huh. Bacon, there at Muskogee. There are just a number of people some that would that be valuable thinking, to you. Yeah, some we're thinking in terms of, for example, would be, uh, well, Fred Olds. 
weather for the uh, the artist. And, right. Uh, oh, he's great. Uh, and of course, Willard Stone over. Oh in the east yes, side I and, love his things. They're Tartan. so symmetrical. Yes, mm -hmm. Very, very mm -hmm. beautiful set. And uh, in the field of military, I'm, I'm just, we think of uh, Irvin Childers, who was a yes. uh, Congressional Medal winner, also of uh, General Modrow, who uh, right. has a considerable uh, Choctaw, I believe, and Chickasaw. Yes, right. And uh, these these are some examples. And uh, uh, well, my friend Marcelin Larkin in Tulsa ha is uh, the other Indian ballerina, one of the mm -hmm. Indian ballerinas, and mm -hmm. she's half Indian. Mm -hmm. How much uh, How much is Maria Tulsi? Maria's father was full blood. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course, her, her mother was Irish. Mm -hmm. Ruth Tulsi. Uh -huh. The, uh, um, do you have, um, what would you say in your life, uh, of course, you have many highlights in, in, in life as exciting as yours was, what would you say was the greatest highlight in, uh, in your career? In my career? Yes, in your career. We'll say next, we'll say in your life if it were different, but let's say in your career. Well, Pam, I really just cannot say there was any one outstanding thing. I was very fortunate. I was very blessed with a number of outstanding events, you know, and to me, I was a very simple, naive girl from Oklahoma. Almost everything was an outstanding mm -hmm. event to me because mm -hmm. I enjoyed life and, you know, I had so many people helping me. It was so good, so kind to me. Mm -hmm. Every role I got was a big occasion, you know. Oh, we danced for very important people, you know, very big celebrities. And all well, these people were always very kind, would come backstage, you know, whether they were presidents or kings or very famous celebrities. Who were some of the presidents you met? Uh, well, Hoover. <laughs> When I was, I was a very little girl, and Eisenhower, they all came to the ballet. They all, all of the, the presidents and their wives were very much involved with the ballet. And, uh, of course, the Kennedys loved ballet. I was interviewed by Jacqueline Bouvier at the time, mm -hmm. who later became Mrs. Kennedy. She was working on one of the Washington papers as a reporter. Uh, tell about her on that interview. Uh, well, she was very gracious, very charming, very much alive. And she loved the ballet very much. Mm -hmm. She was very knowledgeable. She had taken ballet. Of course, you know, we had asked her daughter, Caroline Kennedy, to come down and be our first Clara in the Nutcracker here. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it was just, I, it would be very hard for me just to relate offhand. As I said, there were so many wonderful occasions. You, uh, you're celebrating, uh, I think, the 40th anniversary of your uh, original study of ballet this, uh, this year, possibly, uh, uh, I, I don't know which month, but I know that you had a couple of letters that you uh, were quite proud of, and I certainly would be too. And uh, why, don't you, why don't you read us these letters? The first one, I believe, was the one from the White House. Tell about that. Yeah, well, I was... Uh very surprised. Maybe we should start with the other and work our way up, yes, you I know. I was surprised uh -huh. when I got, uh, saw my uh, letterhead in the mail as I came home from work one day. And, of course, it was a familiar sign, as I had known the Bellmans quite well when they were here. I trained their daughter, Anne, as a matter of fact. She was a lovely girl, very beautiful dancer. And uh, Henry Bellman is the signature here. And it says, Dear Miss Chouteau, it is a pleasure to extend congratulations to you on the occasion of your 40th year of dancing. Your impressive career is a source of pride to all Oklahomans and an inspiration to many who aspire to cultural and artistic endeavors. The contributions you have made and continue to make to the cultural growth of Oklahoma and to the nation deserve the highest commendation from your fellow citizens. Best wishes for continued success. Sincerely, Henry Bellman. I thought that was so nice. And it says, dated the White House, Washington. August 16, 1972. Dear Ms. Chouteau, news has reached me recently from Senator Bellman that you are marking your 40th year as a ballerina. I welcome this opportunity to congratulate you on your outstanding accomplishments and to send you my warm good wishes for continued success in the years ahead. Sincerely, Richard Nixon. That certainly... Oh, I wanted to explain to you, Pan, that uh, you noticed that I said Chouteau. Yes. Now, people in Oklahoma say Shoto. That's just the way we always uh -huh. pronounced it. And when I went to New York, of course, they said, well, well that is a beautiful French name. It should be Shuto. <laughs> so, you know, the word, it, it really is correct in the French pronunciation, Shuto. But if you would say that to many of our 
fellow Oklahomans, they wouldn't know who you're talking about. What was it uh, in the, what was it known as in the days of the fur trader? Was it Shoto then? No, I think it started because the Indians called it Shoto. Is they say right? Shoto. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the, the pronunciation is because the, these French fur traders that came from France, you see, were so close, they just became almost one with the Osage Indian tribe. The, uh, you had quite a few French in the Ballet Roots. Oh, yes. We had a, just all nationalities, you know, all nationalities. Um, Ms. Roberts, do you have any questions or any thoughts that you might ask uh, Yvonne Chateau? This is Ms. Clarence Roberts. Mary Roberts. Uh, I'm just an assistant. I'm just learning. <laughs> but I have been... Absolutely. I have been so interested in what you have said, and I think that your life has just been so interesting. It must have just been thrilling for every day. And when he asked about, for you to name one, I listened very closely to see what one would come from such a full life as you have had. And I think it's such an inspiration to our young people today. It's uh, uh, your respect for and your love for your church and... Uh, your dedication to your art. I think it's wonderful. We're so glad we have you as an Okie. Thank you so much. You know, as I said, that I have so many highlights in my life. I can't say at this particular stage of my development or search for maturity that I could say any more that, oh, it was when I was really official, officially designated as a ballerina. I was just 21, and with my performance of Juliet, I was officially titled ballerina. And then, of course, you know, I stayed another seven, eight years with the Ballet Russe. But I would have to say that it involves so many things, so many wonderful people I met, just the people like, let's say, uh, the man who couldn't hear well, he was deaf, and he came up after performance, and he, he took my hand and held it very tightly, said it was one of the most moving experiences of his life, and yet he was unable to hear the music, but somehow or other I was able to convey to him some sort of a message. What is involved in being officially designated? What? Uh, it's very much like the army. It's just the same being rigid. Yes, you start out at the very low, the uh -huh. back. You know, and I started out in the very last line of the corps de ballet, which is your chorus, and then you slowly wait, work your way up to third soloist, second soloist, first soloist. You know, then uh, demi soloist, and first ballerina, and so on, prima ballerina and all that. It's a long, slow process. It, it is not done overnight. <laughs> the, um, do you have any other thoughts, any other highlights or any other thoughts that you think we ought to put on? I think you've covered the most well, this significant is part of my life, as I said. Yes. I want to ask about the little daughter. I opened the door for her just now. She's charming. Tell us something about her. Did you see both of them? Yeah. Yes. Well, Christina is my eldest daughter. She's 15. Of course, she was born in New York City. And as a matter of fact, I performed on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera House when, until I was seven months expecting her. <laughs> and I just, uh, she danced right along with us every performance, you know. And of course, uh, Elizabeth was born in Montevideo. And they have been, oh, it has been really so like a miracle to me that I, it's a beautiful thing when, you know, you hear them say mom or a mother because I was very much aware of this because Madame Danilova, the prima ballerina saluta, had never been able to have children of her own. So I had become her adopted daughter somewhat and I saw how, how lonely her life was and I have always been firmly convinced that really being a woman is being, a, you know, a wife and a mother and, and serving in that. So I'm so lucky to have had a career and then be able to have a marriage and have children also then come home to this community, which I love, and be able to serve the young people here. It's been a very full life. God has been very good to me. Do you think you'll have a ballerina? They both are beautiful dancers. They dance naturally. They're real dancers. Do they have, uh, do they have professional ambitions? No, they don't. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I, whatever they want to do is fine sure. with me. They're, they're brilliant young girls. They're very good in their academic studies. They write poetry beautifully. They dance beautifully. Uh, Lisa, my youngest, is I think would like to be a cheerleader at the moment. She's very <laughs> hip on football. <laughs> but it was uh, strange that you asked because I was talking with Maria when she was here and she, her daughter's name is Elise. She's 13. She says, no, she has no interest whatsoever in becoming a dancer like her mother. <laughs>
This has been an interview with Yvonne Choteau, one of the great ballerinas of the world, and an Oklahoman and an Oklahoma Indian. And it's been a wonderful, interesting interview. May I also express my thanks and tell you how much I've enjoyed listening? Oh, this is Mary Roberts signing off.